Good evening. We're so glad you're here. For those of you who have joined us before, welcome back to our Thinking Forward series. For those of you who are new, welcome. We're so happy to have you. My name is Heidi Heinbaugh. I'm the events director at The Willows. Before we get into the program, let's go over some Zoom features. After the interview portion, we will have some time for questions and answers. If you're using Zoom on your smartphone or computer, you'll be able to see an icon at the bottom of the screen. Click it and type in your question. Make sure to use the Q&A and not the chat function, which has been disabled for this program. For folks on the phone, Zoom cannot accommodate your questions by phone, so we're sorry, we won't be able to take yours tonight. You'll notice that we have closed captioning available for this presentation. If you want to turn it off, you can click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'll now pass it off to our executive director, Steve DeWint. Thanks, Heidi. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight on Zoom. We're delighted to have you as part of the Willows community for the next hour. As many of you know, our mission at the Willows is to nurture a grace-led community of compassionate and forward-thinking Christian scientists dedicated to boundless spiritual growth and service. That forward-thinking element of our mission is the basis for our Thinking Forward interview series, which was launched in 2021. The goal is to deepen the Willow's connection with ideas and events in the world beyond the gates of our lovely 20-acre campus here in sunny, oh, sorry, actually foggy Southern California. <laughs> you can't have an interview series without an interviewer. Ours is David Cook, who moved to the Willow's with his wife, Linda, in 2017. He now serves on the Willows Board of Directors. David joined the Christian Science Monitor staff in 1969 and served as editor of the Monitor from 1994 to 2001. During that time, the Monitor's website was launched and the paper won the 1996 Pulitzer Prize for international reporting. After his term as editor, David served for 15 years as the Monitor's senior editor and Washington bureau chief. One of his assignments was hosting the Monitor's Washington Newsmaker Breakfasts, presiding at, get this, 672 of them. The bipartisan guest list included Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Jimmy Carter, Colin Powell, John McCain, and Mitch McConnell. And to think I only knew you as a member of the Zoom committee at church. <laughs> Who knew you have this? Dave, why don't you take over? Thanks, Steve. Our guest tonight is Ann Cooling, a Christian science practitioner who serves as the Committee on Publication for Southern California. She served in that role since 2019. For those who may be unfamiliar with the committee, the manager of committees told last year's Mother Church annual meeting that the work was, quote, lifting and healing impositions on public thought about Christian science, Mary Baker Eddy, and our members. Ann Cooling and her contractor husband, John, are both friends of the Willows. She's delivered Bible talks on our campus and at Principia's summer session. Those are in addition to the many talks Anne has given as a representative of Christian scientists in Southern California. Last year, Anne completed her Master of Arts in Theology at the New Theological Seminary of the West. Her thesis was on the relevance of Christian healing, a subject close to her heart. Over the years, Anne has unselfishly served the cause of Christian science in a variety of ways. She was a regional representative of the Mother Church's College and University Activities Department an assistant Christian science nurse for the High Haven Christian Science Nursing Facility, a board member 
at Broadview and Sunland Christian Science Nursing Facilities and an active member of the Laguna Niguel Church where she's currently a Sunday school teacher. In the wider world of religion, Anne is serving on the planning committee for an interfaith group in Orange County, has spoken in numerous interfaith settings and attended national ecumenical meetings. So our guest is well equipped to discuss tonight's topic, the Committee on Publication, responding to the world as it is today. We usually start these programs with a backgrounder on the night's subject. And so here goes. Mary Baker Eddy established the Committee on Publication in its current organizational form in 1910, when she asked church directors to name Christian science practitioner and teacher Alfred Farlow as the first manager of committees. Mrs. Eddy saw the media of her day, newspapers, magazines, books, and pamphlets, or tracts as they were called, as the prime marketplace of ideas. She wrote to Farlow saying, quote, the press impresses more minds mortal than we really estimate. From the beginning, Farlow and his committee co-workers had their hands full. In 1901, the committee wrote to the publisher of the New York Times, protesting the paper's reference to Christian science and its adherents, using disparaging terms like reckless and greedy quacks and humbug healers. Farlow spent 14 years defending Christian science and its founder, and then this Midwest native decided to leave Boston's chilly charms and retire in Los Angeles. The media environment in which Anne and other state committees function is strikingly different from the one Farlow faced. In addition to broadcast radio and TV, there are many new streaming video outlets from Disney, Amazon, Netflix, and Apple, and countless podcasts. In recent years, newspapers and magazines, which were so powerful in Mrs. Eddy's day, have declined sharply in numbers and importance. Meanwhile, today, the internet and social media apps allow everyone to comment on everything with little concern for accuracy, complicating the committee's corrective work. Finally, the committee operates in a climate where organized religion seems less important, and only 28% of Americans now say they are regular churchgoers. Those are some of the forces behind tonight's timely topic, the Committee on Publication responding to the world as it is today. So Anne, thanks so much for being here. Let's start at the beginning. What is the Committee on Publication? Well, thank you, David. My role as defined in the Manual of the Mother Church points to the healing work that stands behind the work we do. It is to correct in a Christian manner impositions on the public in regard to Christian science, injustices done Mary Baker Eddy and members of this church by the daily press, etc. Impositions, just to define that word generally, means burdens, deceptions, misconceptions. So much of what I do is pray to heal the impositions in public thought with the Christ spirit that is needed and will guide whatever further corrective is needed. Essentially, committees on publication are in the healing practice for the public about the role and place of our church. Our most important work is the specific daily healing treatment focused on this purpose. This healing work helps lift the shade of gloom to make radiant room so the public can glimpse the glorious science of the Christ. Our leader, Mary Baker Eddy, and her true light and light, and our church, which which shares the good news of God with the world as taught in Christian science. It's important to be clear that the role of the Committee on Publication is to correct impositions on the public, not on Christian science or Christian scientists. However, all members are a part of the public. So this work helps us to be alert 
and be prayerfully addressing public misconceptions that would try to hide the value and gift of divine science, the promised comforter so that we're not taking in these falsehoods in very subtle ways. I found this to be helpful in how I approach the work. So viewed from the outside, the Committee on Publication may look like a church public relations operation. According to biographer Robert Peel, Mrs. Eddy and Alfred Farlow, the first manager of committees, had a very different motive in establishing the committee. In his book, Years of Authority, Peel says Farlow and Mrs. Eddy viewed the committee as a branch of the healing activity of Christian science, healing impositions on public thought, as you were saying, Anne, and leaving people free, as Peel says, to judge the religion on its merits or demerits. What's your view of the role of prayer in the committee's work? Well, I found it important to val continually value the prayer that's done in the committee work as being effective and the most powerful corrective we offer. Peel makes a statement in Years of Authority on page 227. Mary Baker Eddy began by saying that the silent declarations of truth which heal the sick and transform the sinful may be typified by gold coinage and the audible de de declarations of truth by silver coinage. She then explained that public utterances of Christian science were like paper money, which finds its way everywhere and is a wonderful medium of exchange, provided always that it's backed and represents the gold. So whatever we write or say needs to be backed by the gold to have healing value. I've been cherishing that my prayers be living prayers that operate more deeply from the basis of the one mind, divine mind communicating directly to his own without separation. The mind of Christ operates entirely based on the one mind to heal, to express grace, to spiritually discern and understand what's presenting itself. I'm not naive that this is a tall order. It's gonna take daily humility, willingness, self-reflection and prayerful defense. However, it's innate to our spirituality as God's reflection, God's knowing, God's being. So you can see Mrs. Eddy's vision of Committee on Publication work to serve the greater blessing of lifting up and off these impositions on public thought versus the world's thought of a self-serving focus found in public relations. So and I know you've got an example of how your office handled a local newspaper story about an unhoused man Cashman Whitley, sleeping on the steps of a local Christian science church. Can you briefly explain the situation and how you dealt with it in a way designed to heal rather than engage in promotion or defensiveness? Because of our sincere desire as Christian scientists to follow Christ Jesus' teachings, to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves, it's not easy to read a media account that creates the impression that we either individually or collectively as a church thoughtlessly and carelessly ignore the needs of individuals in our communities. Well, this was a case in a recent story that garnered national attention in the United States about an unhoused individual found sleeping on the steps of a Christian Science Church in Southern California. Well, after naming the church, the article continued with a quote from one of the women who helped the hom homeless man. I couldn't wrap my head around finding this man sleeping on a concrete slab in front of a church, Flora said. I just thought, you know the irony, I was angry and disappointed and I just thought if our institutions aren't doing anything, that as individuals, we need to step in 
because this guy needs help. Well, taking the case up in prayer, along with offering a letter to the editor, the committee office and branch church worked to still any sense of defensiveness or self-justification. In fact, this branch and its members had been actively involved over many years, taking practical steps to help this individual with intermittent success. As is often the case when faced with these types of impositions, it's the enduring heart of our Christian values and practice that help negate these public misconceptions. In these opportunities, there's a richness in humbly giving the public a clear understanding of how members strive to live and express their Christianity, as our leader affirms in miscellaneous writings. Beloved children, the world has need of you, and more as children than as men and women. It needs your innocence, unselfishness, faithful affection, uncontaminated lives. You all need also to watch and pray that you preserve these virtues unstained and lose them not through contact with the world. What grander ambition is there than to maintain in yourselves what Jesus loved and to know that your example, more than words, makes morals for mankind. So at one point, Mrs. Eddy called for, quote, more real Christianity, unquote, in responding to critics in the press. Uh, that was quoted in the December 2004 journal, among other places. What have you learned about corrective responses from studying Mrs. Eddy's instruction and example? I've been studying Mary Baker Eddy's examples of corrective responses for my own prayers as committee. Mrs. Eddy, after making a correction, most of the time then shifted to lifting up the conversation and utilizing the corrective as a healing opportunity. And thinking about the corrective answer, example that I just shared, from the first draft and in the spirit of church, we looked for a natural way to include a healing truth needed to address the issue of homelessness by pointing to the Savior and God's love as the ultimate healing answer. Further prayerful listening led to a letter to the editor that was just right. In fact, the branch church member said, it was less self-justifying and more healing. I learned that expressing love for the community, the helpers and cashmen was more important than trying to save face by telling everything we had tried to do. The letter is lovely and loving. The published letter is so short that I'd like to read it to you as an example of the healing tone that we've been talking about. Dear Editor, editor we were happy to read about the kind women who found Cashman Whitley sleeping on our church's property and to learn that he has been more recently receptive to help and is on the mend. Our membership has been involved for a number of years in an effort to help Cashman with varying degrees of success. In addition to many individual efforts, We've also worked with area social service agencies and have followed the recommendation of local authorities to offer helpful solutions. Though homelessness is an issue in our area, our membership continues to prayerfully and practically look to find solutions. Paul affirms that no one can be separated from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so it is that we are grateful to see our community in action, blessing our friend Cash. And we are overjoyed to find him doing so well. Before taking, talking more about how you deal with impositions or misconceptions about Christian science, it would be useful to provide a brief list so people know 
what we mean by that term. One confusion is with Scientology, leading to reports of Christian scientists being asked if they'd met Tom Cruise. What do we need to know about the specific challenges you face in order to support the committee work more effectively? Well, if you want to explore these impositions, you can look at every watchwords newsletter since the beginning of 2019, where we've been covering one at a time in prayer watches, which includes background, citations, and sharing of inspiration. These watchwords are available in the archives of the member section of the Committee on Publication for Southern California website, ChristianScienceSoCal.org. You'll need to be a member of a local branch church and register to get access. That, by the way, that address will also be on the list of citations for tonight. The prayer watches help the field to be aware of these impositions and join the committee office in prayer, which supports our own practices, our churches, and Christian science. There are specific impositions on the public that we are alert to in our work, ones that we know are not true about Christian science. These impositions include our Christianity, our healing practice, the future and relevance of Christian science, Mary Baker Eddy, and our members. There's real work to be done in addressing these impositions, and I encourage you each to take them up in your healing practice. This citation from Mrs. Eddy is a good reminder for us in this work. The cause of Christian science is prospering throughout the world and stands forever as an eternal and demonstrable science. And I do not regard this attack upon me as a trial. For when these things cease to bless, they will cease to occur. These impositions in public thought are not new. We know Mary Baker Eddy was addressing them as, as well and was led to establish the Committee on Publication. Both Jesus and Mary Baker Eddy were very thoughtful and prayerful in their communications, and it is of great value to embrace these attributes ourselves. We can continue to turn to their examples uh, in how we can approach the work today. So when Mrs. Eddy established the committee, newspapers were the dominant information technology radio and TV and the internet were not on the scene. Now the newspaper industry is in decline, I'm sorry to say, and the internet has led to instant communication by a multiplicity of news outlets with widely differing standards. How has the age of social media changed the role of the Committee on Publication? That's a great question, David. And though social media does play an active part in the corrective work, in truth, the role of the Committee on Publication remains unchanged. As we've been talking about from Mrs. Eddy's day right up until present day, the, the primary role of committee work is, to, is one of being a healer. Whether the imposition in the public comes through a major news outlet, a YouTube video, or a tweet, we take up the case in prayer and strive to humbly and obediently follow minds leading for our corrective response. This approach has not changed in the work since the Office of the Committee on Publication was first established. But as you point out, and I think what you're getting at, social media affords different opportunities and does require special attention and alertness in the work. In many respects, it is an unfiltered and unmoderated form of communication that not always but often belies thoughtful dialogue and sincere exchange of ideas, often reactionary and highly opinionated. As important as it is to be alert to what's being said on various platforms, Paul's counsel to come out from among them and be ye separate is needful. 
So, um, and given the challenges inherent in social media, applications like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, how does the committee approach corrective work in this new media space? Well, we strive to be wise and thoughtful in how we participate. As, we, as with each case, we prayerfully listen for whether a response will truly help public thought and open the way for the comforter to assuage fears based on deceptions about Christian science. And yet, because of the strong reactionary nature of the dialogue, pausing and praying become all the more important. It seems like social media is operating at this rapid speed and, and we encounter this sense of feeling rushed to respond, but that's not always helpful or what is need, needed. Sometimes a corrective response only serves to fuel the flames of even further impositions or it reignites a conversation that has already moved on to another subject. We know that the healing Christ is never clouded over and must be felt. The healing Christ is what is most needed. It is the answer. So even though we don't always tweet, we always respond. Those prayers are the strongest part of anything we do in terms of a response. And this has been helpful to me in realizing my role as a Christian scientist in public dialogue. It is to love and to heal, to lift up and unify, defend and engage with the Christ consciousness that is immersed in divine truth. Also, as we pray, ways sometimes open up in other places that are more productive. I've seen this and I love those moments because they remind me that the one mind is at the helm. It's like God illustrating to me, I've got this. So in preparing for this event, you've talked about how social media platforms require wisdom if Christian scientists are to communicate successfully. Mrs. Eddy's biographer, Robert Peel, quotes from a letter she wrote to a state committee. She said, students may speak altogether too metaphysically to others than Christian scientists. I have often told them of this and shown them the advantage it gives those who sneer at an absolute science, unquote. Yeah, that's a really good point. A word to the wise for those of you on various social media platforms. Remember that these are public forums. Even groups that may be mostly Christian scientists still may be seen by those unfamiliar with Christian science. Holding this in thought will help you use language that is clear and consistent with what we've been talking about tonight um, that give us a clear understanding of our religion. Speaking of social media, some aspects of Wikipedia, the online encyclopedia, are not accurate. The Mother Church recently has posted on its website an encyclopedic entry on Christian science that the Committee on Publication says, quote, comes closer to the heart of the religion, unquote, than the Wikipedia's current entry on Christian science. What can you tell us about this important step? When it comes to correcting in a Christian manner impositions on the public in regard to Christian science and its founder, Wikipedia in many ways presents unique challenges. While there are points of progress and some balanced and accurate information to appreciate in its entries, it continues to be difficult for Christian scientists to recognize its movement or its founder on Wikipedia. Addressing the impositions on the public contained in these articles has long remained a priority for the Committee on Publication Manager's Office. 
In recent years, a team, including one member who is a registered participant on Wikipedia, has been devoted to this work. While there's been some gratifying progress, the obstacles remain as formidable as the number of visitors to the site. A substantial number of Wikipedians monitor the entries and with a few keystrokes, they can reverse any edits introduced. Well, as in all Committee on Publication work, the essence of Wikipedia's team efforts has been spiritual. It calls for patience, persistence, meekness, and discernment, among many other qualities. One of the ideas that emerged from this spiritual work is to offer the, a corrective response to Wikipedia's entries on Christian Science and Mary Baker Eddy on the church's own website, christianscience.com, under the Press Room tab. This has taken the form of an entry on Christian Science that was published in a three-volume scholarly work on American religious history. It was written by a Christian scientist who was both an academically trained historian and a Christian science practitioner and teacher. We remain grateful for the lift this article is bringing to public consciousness. And we are gonna have the uh, link for that article uh, on the references that we'll have at the end of the program. Let's talk for a moment about one of the challenges facing the committee, namely the rise of artificial intelligence. In simplified terms, artificial intelligence programs like ChatGPT answer questions by using a search engine algorithm to understand and generate text, which can sound like it was written by a human being. Artificial intelligence programs function by learning patterns in language from vast amounts of text data. And here's the key concern. The answers the technology produces are only as reliable as the data artificial intelligence learns from, which theoretically could include inaccurate material about Christian science. Can you give us some insight in how the rise of artificial intelligence could affect the committee's work? Well, we know this topic is creating a stir and has been the topic of a plethora of articles and discussions since going mainstream of November of last year. It requires thoughtful consideration and as a committee office, we are paying attention. However, no matter what's happening with technology, we can always go back to the foundation of the committee's purpose of healing impositions on the public thought about Christian science. We're always alert and discerning to the impositions in public thought, whether generated by a computer or an individual. But the committee work isn't influenced by these impositions. The work founded on the rock of truth is unmoved and is the light that corrects and heals. Jesus and Mary Baker Eddy spoke of the importance of this alertness to mortal mind, exposing its ways and means, and for the need to see it for what it is. And I find the following passages helpful. Jesus said, we can't enter into this strong man's house and spoil his goods until we first bind the strong man. Mary Baker Eddy's commentary on this passage states, mortal mind is the strong man which must be held in subjection before its influence upon health and morals can be removed. This error conquered can we can despoil the strong man of his goods, namely of sin and disease. So we're asked to be alert to these new methods, to be discerning, but always to stay with the Christ spirit, to be about our Father's business of bearing witness to the healing light of Christ in the world. 
So you mentioned in our conversations that you've been thinking about the scientific age from the Committee on Publications standpoint. What does that mean in practical terms about how Christian scientists engage with the public? You know, I want to go back to the last question you asked just really quickly because sure. one of the thoughts I'm having, David, is I ask myself, how are my thoughts resting on the world? Or is the world resting on me? And I, 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 I found that helpful and I just, I wanted to share that. But getting to your next question, living in a scientific age, I have been contemplating, how are we communicating as a church to meet the world thought to meet world thought with the important part of the conversation that we have to give, embracing more of the leaven of divine science. If leaven raises dough, we wanna make sure that we're activating in our thought, the leaven of science, as well as the other leavens of religion and medicine, or we're gonna have lopsided bread, aren't we? The world for the most part today is engaging differently than in Mrs. Eddy's religious day. They're engaging scientifically and they're more open to listen from that standpoint. Well, once we move and open our own thought, the father takes over pouring forth his inspiration. But again, this is going to take a lot of care and letting divine mind guide us. It takes meekness, the gentle spirit of Christ, not unwarranted zeal or another human opinion that inherits the earth. Recognize that what's going on is not a human demand, but divine science doing the demanding. We are here at this point in society because of the revelation of divine mind, opening vistas of thought broader than ever before. Imagine how the view of God from the standpoint of divine science would at least change the understanding of God and religion within the world. I just did a talk for a local high school international baccalaureate class and explained why Mary Baker Eddy used the term science to describe her religion. Here's how I simply described a profound concept within the world. Christian science views Jesus' healings and other works not as interruptions of a material reality, but as scientific demonstrations of a spiritual reality that is ordered by God. These healings demonstrate that God's love is actual law, always available and at hand to free humanity. This is what the science part of Christianity is, not physical science, but the knowledge of God how God progressively revealed himself as humanity's experiences with God grew in grace and how it can be naturally and dependably applied in human life. Ken, uh, I want to go back. Uh, we had a, this isn't actually this, the time for listener questions, but I've seen a couple coming in and one of them asked uh, if you would give us another sentence or two about your statement about uh, are my thoughts resting on the world or is the world resting on me? Can you say, can you give us another sentence on that before we move on? Yes. So often when we're, when we take in the thoughts of the world, they begin, they, it feels like they're resting on us, doesn't it? And I think it's important that we make sure that we're bringing our thought to rest upon the world right. and getting letting the world rest upon us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got uh, we, we've got more I've got more questions <laughs> than we've got time. Um, before we go to listener uh, questions, 
let me ask you um, one other, uh, and that's about communicating um, in a way that doesn't feed misconceptions. You had, in our conversations, you had some really helpful things to say about that. What has your work taught you about the importance of communicating in a way that doesn't feed misconceptions? Well, I think it, get back, it gets back to that Christian manner. I think we can always start with God's two great commandments as a guide to love God and love our fellow man. That's the heart of how we approach all our work in a Christian manner. It means that we're deeply inspired by and strive to follow the teachings and example of the master Christian, Christ Jesus. It's moving to consider how Mary Baker Eddy is asking us to hold this selfless love deep in our hearts, to love the public enough to metaphysically and practically lift off misconceptions so humanity has the opportunity to be blessed by the comforter. It's this Christian manner that approaches or this, it's this Christian approach that heals all manner of impositions. We live in a world of sound bites, of reactionary social media that give the carnal mind a field day if we're not pausing in prayer with divine mind, immersing ourselves in the Christ spirit and surrendering the human for the divine. The Committee on Publication workshops available this year in Southern California um, for branch and mother or mother church members share examples and explore in greater depth how Mary Baker Eddy corrected impositions on Christian science and injustices to herself. She has a number of examples in prose works and a whole chapter called Some Objections Answered. And in terms of uh, continuing dialogue with people, you've talked about the importance of communicating in a way uh, where people's fears can be abated. You said to say something about that. Um, yeah. Um, I, I we, we skipped something. Did I miss something here? <laughs> uh, for time purposes, I'm just um, moving, moving on. on. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> no problem. So give me the question again. because The I was question like, is, you've talked about the importance of communicating in a way that doesn't feed misconceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, and rather right. than, for example, if you're asking for an accommodation on... Um, a physical exam or something like that, rather than just giving somebody a form, uh, talking to them so that their fears might be of, about Christian science might be abated. You know, Christ Jesus commanded the disciples to go forth and preach the gospel. And, and he, in many ways, was telling them to share the good news that they've experienced with others, to let the example of their lives open the hearts of others to Christ. This work isn't trying to convince someone else of our point of view, any more than it's trying to get them to do something that we want them to do or to give us something. In humility, we strive to share the sincerity of our religious belief and practice and offer a richer perspective about Christian science. There's plenty of room for a written corrective, but it's wonderful to engage in meaningful dialogue with others. In those instances, there's a richness in the give and take, the sharing of ideas that helps to break down misconceptions. So let me get to the example that you're talking about here, Dave. It used to be that the committee office had forms that members filled out in order to utilize accommodations within the law, like vaccination or physical exams for students. And it was just 
it was easy to just hand that green form across the desk of a school or employer with no explanation or conversation with the recipient and go on our way. But that did little to address misconceptions in public thought or to assuage fears of the public about a system of healing that they know little about. Instead, taking the time to have a conversation that offers your perspective, answers their questions, affirms the shared goals of love and care for others, and helps to calm their fears. This is an expression of Christian grace and kindness. We're very grateful for the accommodations within the law, and the committee office remains a resource for you. I'm glad to help you think further about the opportunity to engage in this dialogue, which may include explaining the reason for your request or the sincerity of your religious practice. And who knows how the Father is going to utilize that conversation for another healing opportunity as you're about your Father's business. Thanks, Anne. So we're going to go turn now to audience questions. As Heidi explained at the beginning of tonight's program, members of our audience can send in questions for Ann Cooling using Zoom. Look for the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Click the button, write your question, and hit send. Ann will respond to as many questions as possible during the time allotted for them in our program, which is roughly 15 minutes. Let me start with one uh, that's come in, Ann. Uh, from somebody watching on Zoom. What do you do if your response to an imposition or criticism does not satisfy? Do you continue to provide additional clarification or stop responding, as you say, simply fueling the fire? There's no formulas for this work. Um, everything we do is, is prayerfully led. And so we pray before we respond, we pray during the response, and if we don't get the response we need, we keep praying. Um, we've seen countless examples where there wasn't the response we were looking for, and prayer led for a, a further outreach to an individual or a news outlet. And just like in any kind of healing case, even though it doesn't yield, you still keep praying at it and you expect it to yield. And we've seen that yielding take place. Um, so it's very gratifying to just keep at it and, and let the Father guide you. Let me ask you, uh, we mentioned uh, in the setup uh, for tonight's discussion that Americans are somewhat less religious than in the past. Fewer than half of all Americans are now church members according to polling by Gallup organization, the decline in membership is particularly pronounced among younger generations. Yet in our conversations, you said you've seen some encouraging trends. What are they? Yes, I, you know, there are wonderful things that are taking place and I'll, I'll be happy to share an example with you. Um, one of the things that that I've seen, um, you know, it's a, it's a shifting of thought and it's, it's exciting, but it's happening in small but profound ways. So I'll give you one example. Religious scholars such as Phyllis Tickle, John Sweeney and others are commenting that religion is on the start of another great awakening. It's what they refer to as the age of the spirit. Scholars are commenting on the resurgence of the Holy Spirit since the start of Christian science and Pentecostalism that is moving into other churches' worship experiences, discussions, and experiences regarding theology and healing. There are also ecumenic, a number of ecumenical studies, such as health, healing, spirituality, the future of the church's ministry of healing as well as other books on this subject, including substantive comments within books and scholarly articles. Christian science may not be seen as central to this dialogue, 
but its leavening effect is unmistakable. So this could move us to ask ourselves some questions that are worth thinking through in our own practice. How do you see your role as a Christian scientist in this awakening of consciousness? What is bringing this age of the spirit into the world? How is divine science leading the way? Well, of course, God is bringing this understanding of spirit and its healing agency to the world. We have much to share in what that age of the spirit looks like. In understanding God as spirit and therefore God's creation as spiritual. We, again, need to be thoughtful and prayerful in how we dialogue, not using uh, jargon, but with the Christ spirit, that healing presence of the Christ. Thanks, Anne. Um, somebody has written in the following question. Can you offer suggestions on how we can personally and as a church reach out to our communities? Um, Got an hour? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, there's so many ways, and, and they have to be prayer-led. So, um, and I think desire is prayer. So when you have that desire and you go to the Father, there'll be ways that will open up and um, to have a discussion as a church, to think that through together is a, is a wonderful opportunity to pray and, and um, think through church together. So I... I, I don't want to, you know, give ideas, and, and I'd rather you go to the Father to, to think that through. Um, but our, our prayers for the world are doing amazing things, and is the most, it is the gift Christian science has to bring, and those prayers have legs. They're going to lead to action. Um, so as we change our thought, wonderful things happen. So here's a question uh, about the Christian Science Monitor from a, uh, somebody who's tuned in on Zen, Zoom. Uh, how can the monitor get more positive media news out to help combat the continuous negative world news every day? It seems the only loud news is if it bleeds, it leads. Well, I've been really excited to see what the monitor does. As Committee on Publication, I'm not involved with the monitor. That's not my role. But I have really liked their value-driven um, and inviting the reader along to say why we wrote this and, and here are the values behind it. Because I, I feel like they're inviting the public in to do what Mary Baker Eddy asked us to do as members of her church, to pray for the world, utilizing the, the monitor as a tool and to know what's going on in the world. And so we're literally helping the public understand how we do that through their value-driven um, reporting. So I, I think they're doing a, a great for job to me personally in helping me um, stay with a, a, a more positive aspect of the news while not shrinking away from telling us what we need to know within the world that needs healing. So I've been getting ready for this. Uh, I, I've obviously read a few things about the monitor in my time, but I found this wonderful quote from Alfred Farlow, the first manager of committees, in a letter to Mrs. Eddy uh, from July 1910, where he says, it's wonderful what the monitor is doing as a missionary. It is opening the way for our literature, including your works. It is a better missionary than the Christian scientists because it does not talk too much. It does not commit Christian science unwisely, and it does not disgrace us by unwise answers to insincere questions of critics. So blessings on you, Alfred Farlow, once again. <laughs> um, it's time for our last questions, and apologies uh, that we haven't had time to answer all those that uh, came in for Anne. In uh, August 1909, 
Mrs. Eddy wrote uh, to the publication uh, committee and publication manager, uh, the aforementioned Alfred Farlow, stressing how important it was to stay awake and alive, especially in the healing practice. She wrote, quote, stir the dry bones all over the field to more words, actions, and demonstration in Christian science. Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Could you please close by discussing the importance of healing to the work of the committee? How are we going to respond to a hungry world with human opinions that are running around the world, with human culture, with self-serving agendas, reacting to the world with fear or feeling overwhelmed by the world and walking away? No, we've been given the gift of healing. And I'm coming to the conclusion, Dave, that we don't really have a choice because in this global instant communication world, if we're not responding with healing, we're taking in more of the world than I think we realize and swimming along with public thought in a way that's not conducive to our health or our salvation, let alone the health and salvation of the world. We all know the Bible story of the unused talent. So it behooves ourselves to and our churches and our world to behold the unchanging light of Christ that is always here to be seen, to heal, to give wisdom, life, and inspirational ideas that destroy error, lift up and open up. You know, healing is just a change of thought, and we can change our thought at any time. So often we think the world needs to change its thought. But incredible things happen when we do. So our thanks to Anne Cooling for all the time she put in preparing for this and for her res inspiring responses to our questions. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure talking to Anne. If you wanna see a replay of tonight's interview, it will be available under the events tab on the Willows website, which is www.thewillowscommunity.org. And now let me turn the program back to the Willows Executive Director, Steve DeWin. Thanks to everyone who worked on this event. Thanks to Heidi for, for uh, being in the background and pulling together all of the logistics. Thanks to Deanna for working on the marketing. Thanks to Dave for continuing to serve as the interview interviewer for this entire series. And mostly, thanks to Ann Cooling for giving us an inside look at the and an explanation of the role of the Christian Science Committee on publication. Watch for an announcement of the next installment in this series. Good night, everybody. <laughs>